Goal 4 of the Sustainable Development Goals, Quality Education, describes STEM and STEAM curriculum. There are currently two educational approaches to teaching children in the U.S., the STEM curriculum and the STEAM curriculum. STEM focuses on educating students in four specific disciplines, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. STEM incorporates these principles into a cohesive paradigm that encourages motivation, engagement, and employs real-world applications. STEAM adds the arts to education and uses the five points to guide student inquiry, dialogue, and critical thinking. STEM supporters believe that curriculum naturally involves the arts. Examples include product design and the communication skills needed for language arts. STEAM supporters say incorporating the arts into the other disciplines devalues arts importance. These two forms of teaching are not too different from each other. Exploring opportunities where art naturally fits into the STEM narrative can help create a healthy balance. Treating art as an applied subject, such as math and science, will give students a new discipline to learn that can also be applied to real-world situations. Design classes can help students learn how to create logos and organize information into presentations. Performing arts, like drama and speech, can help translate into technical writing and persuasive writing skills, which are abilities used in technology-driven and marketing career fields. Creative planning calls for students to use the right side of their brain to think outside of the box, which can come in handy when needing to create content and innovative thinking. Science, technology, engineering, the arts, and mathematics are all important factors that make up the curriculum. Being able to learn about all of them will lead to well-rounded and versatile professionals. Presenter, the next speaker. Um, the next speaker um, is um, Professor Fallows. Um, so, just a quick introduction about um, on Professor Fallows is is a Hungarian legal historian and philosopher, also an active advocate with twenty eight years of professional experience. Um, she worked as a university lecturer in various positions, and currently she's an associate prof professor at the University of. Um, Navarros, I hope I pronounced that right, um, a lecturer at the Faculty of Law, um, University of X, a research fellow at Women Researchers Council of Azerbaijan State University of Economics, and attorney at law at Dr. Fallows Law Office, also in PEX. So she's an editorial board member of the International Journal of Law and Society, the Journal of Management and Economics Research, and the editor of the English volumes of the Civil Review. So um, she'll be talking to us today on sustainability and law. So welcome to um, Professor Fallows with us. So you have the floor. Take it. Again, I express my gratitude uh, uh, towards the Green Institute uh, for uh, inviting me, though I am only a lawyer. Uh, and I can only speak about sustainability from the perspective of uh, law and uh, legislation. However, I would like to add that I really enjoyed the, uh, the previous lecture, as I am a lecturer of a university where uh, nuclear plant engineers are uh, trained in Hungary. Um, 
and um, there is a great debate on whether uh, nuclear energy is green or not. Of course, I'm on the side of um, of greenness rather than I only on the oil. So uh, what will be the uh, topic of my um, lecture for today? Uh, first, I would like to speak about the Brunsland report and its background after um, about legal sustainability from a classical interpretation point of view. Uh, after, I would like to introduce the three pillars of sustainability. And I will end with a conclusion where I um, uh, try to give or explain my uh, concept or my explanation for a definition rather for sustainable law. Uh, on this slide, you can see the photo of uh, Gro Harlem Brundtland. Um, she was the first uh, uh, female prime minister of Norway, um, uh, Labour Party minister, and the deputy di director of the WHO. So all it started in uh, 1983, where the United Nations General Assembly um, welcomed the establishment of a special committee uh, that should prepare a report on the environment and global issues for the year 2000 and beyond, including proposed strategies uh, um, uh, in, in, uh, sorry, somebody, somebody uh, disturbed me with a, uh, with a note. Okay, so including uh, proposed strategies for sustainable uh, development. Although the name of the commission officially was uh, not Brundtland, but uh, the World Commission on uh, Environment and Development, uh, afterwards the name uh, Brundtland Commission uh, became common in use uh, after uh, Gro Harlem Brundtland. Uh, the report uh, uh, number uh, A42 uh, 427 uh, titled our common future uh, entered the public consciousness, even though, like Brunson report, and in the same resolution, the United Nations General Assembly decided that the report, this Brunson report, um, uh, would be uh, the first instance uh, by the program of the uh, Governing Council afterwards. So it was used as a raw material um, in the preparation uh, of the environmental protection perspective for the year 2000 and uh, beyond. Uh, the most frequently cited uh, definition of sustainable uh, development comes from uh, that very uh, report as a development that meets the needs of the present, without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. The concept of sustainable development was initially fully appropriated by environmental protection and the environmental protection law rooted in it afterwards. However, since the economic growth compulsively generated by consumer societies became unsustainable, it became clear that the problem cannot be solved by environmental protection alone. Modern conceptual frameworks are now filled with content by the social sciences, one of which is my science, my field, the legal science as an applied discipline. Uh, here you can see uh, on the slide the limits to growth. Uh, it was a, a booklet uh, uh, written uh, for the uh, order of the Club of Rome. Um, during these um, uh, decades, a lot of publications uh, uh, was published uh, uh, on the over-consuming uh, problem uh, and the economic situation became fatal. Lin, Cheng and Hu likened the global economy to a zombie that is half alive, half dead, reeling with its own symptoms. They believe that this economic zombie may soon die out, diagnosed with a condition known as zero growth, 
economic stagnation. Free capitalism, which preached unlimited growth, depend on consumption, is coming to an end, I'm afraid. In modern economics, many terms are used to describe the unlimited growth paradigm of economic growth, such as unlimited growth, perpetual growth, and infinite growth of economic uh, paradigm. In a framework of market economy, the game is to maximize the profits of the shareholders with the globalizing structure. In this structure, people are self-interested, rational, and competitive, leading to additional wealth from consumption. In this system, uh, companies must focus exclusively on profit and growth, which prevents the development of a monopoly situation and creates free markets in the spirit of globalization with the diminishing returns of economies of sale. All this actually, however, seemed impossible more than a decade ago in the light of the highly influential paper of the limits to growth I was referring to uh, before, uh, in which the Club of Rome drew attention to the fact that the paradigm of limitless growth, the industrialization model of economic development, is not only humanities and nature's cause sharp contradictions, but people still have to face nature's revenge. In current patterns of rapid growth, in population and capital continue, the world will be in danger of catastrophic collapse. Therefore, the best way to avoid collapse is to implement policies of zero growth, zero population growth, and zero economy growth. However, the situation did not improve despite early calls for attention. As a result of the global economic stagnation of the 21st century, it became obvious that the success of the Western style modernization requires large sums of expenditure. Oliver Martley has described five possible future outcomes of the current situation as early as in 1972. The second of which is the civilization disintegration as the last station of the unlimited growth paradigm. And now uh, in this very age, we are really facing this problem. Debates about sustainability and sustainable development have undergone a significant transformation over time. While at the beginning, the focus of the international community's attention was economic development, namely the prevention of poverty in connection with integration into the global capitalist economy. By the end of the century, the focus shifted to another political initiative, the environmental protection. The concept, of sustainability in today's public consciousness was developed, which advocates the need for international cooperation in order to prevent environmental pollution and preserve biological diversity and ecosystems. By now, by the 21st century, these efforts have directly evolved into current efforts to deal with climate change, sometimes leading to the destruction of priceless are treasures by extreme uh, activists, which lead nowhere, I think. The general principles and rules of international environmental law are reflected in binding legal acts, international organizations, uh, state practice, court decisions, and non-binding legal commitments. The existence and applicability of the principles of international environmental law were also confirmed by an arbitral tribunal in a unique case, the Iron Rhine case uh, from uh, 2005. Uh, these principles are general in the sense that they potentially apply to all members of the international community for the full range of activities they undertake or authorize, and for the protection of all aspects of the environment. 
from the large collection of international agreements and other legal acts, general rules and principles can be established that have broad, if not necessary, universal support and are supported in law enforcement in practice as well. For example, the Stockholm Declaration uh, from uh, 1972 or the Rio Declaration um, uh, after uh, from 1992, um, and particularly uh, its principle uh, number two, according to which states have sovereignty over their natural resources and are obliged not to cause transboundary envi environmental damage, also the principle of uh, preventive action, the principle of cooperation, the principle of sustainable development, the precautionary principle, and the polluter pace uh, principle. Um, these are uh, also signs of uh, 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 general universal responsibility. Uh, by now, it has become obvious that the argument that sustainability or sustainable development serves only economic or even environmental protection purposes is problematic. The wording that recognizes that both economic and environmental development must be sustainable, it as durable and long-term seems more accurate. Following this change, uh, we see that the realization that social policy is vital for achieving both economic and environmental goals is gaining more and more legitimacy. Hence, the appearance of the three pillars of sustainability in the literature, namely the economic, the environmental, and the social pillars. Since all pillars are ultimately regulated by legal norms in developed societies, it is obvious that sustainability as a phenomenon should also be scrutinized from the point of view of law and in narrower sense of legislation as a social science. Despite the fact that for critical environmental protection lawyers, this modern three-pillared concept of sustainability may certainly seem like an unconcertably modernist approach. Ideally, it would be more correct to consider this approach um, as more holistic. It is a fashionable word, however, it works for sustainability um, aspects as well. At the same time, it can also cause frustration for lawyers dealing with social policy, such as labor lawyers, that labor standards and other aspects of social policy are only considered protected within the framework of sustainability, insofar as they are seen to be connected to the dominant trends of economic and environmental sustainability, and they are subordinated. Holism thus has its dangers when it obscures the primacy of some goals over others. Such a requirement established by the consistent practice of the constitutional force all over the world in relation to the right to a healthy environment in connection with the determination of the level of uh, institutional protection includes the prohibition of retrogression, the principles of environmental sustainability and the specific principles of sustainable development including the principles of good governance. An example of the latter is the principle of uh, community participation, subsidiarity, cooperation, publicity, and informed decision-making. If we accept the interpretation of sustainability recorded in the Brundtland Report, it is clear that only the term is modern, but the phenomenon it describes is as old as human societies, as mankind itself. In the course of history, humanity has had to deal with difficulties many times, which in today's sense can be apostrophized as the sustainability terms, and for the solution of which it became necessary 
to generate changes in the field of legislation, which enabled further development in such a way that the survival of society for the gen next generations uh, ensured. Um, legislation always strives for sustainability. The goal is to create legal norms that ensure long-term application of the law in the area to be regulated, thereby creating legal certainty, which meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs, as the Brundtland report stated. So going through this chain of thought, sustainable law can be um, uh, can be explained or defined as a system of uh, legal norms um, that are always useful for society, enable the satisfaction of its reasonable needs, but do not endanger the rights of future generations and the codifications of which is the primary task of states of law. A just an equitable society based on a legal system that ensures social equality and human rights undoubtedly guarantees a better and more sustainable future for generations to come. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, thank you very it's much. A joke for you for, for the end. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you very much, Professor Palos, for that. Um presentation. So there are quite a lot of questions in the Q&A. And um, I'm just going to like take one or two of them because of time. So um, there's a question here. They said, um, is sustainable development really a binding rule of law? Um, and the, the follow-up question is, that, is there, are there any binding multilateral treaties signed by countries to protect this? Yes, of course. There are a lot of uh, international treaties. Uh, of course, you know, international law is special uh, in the sense that it is not uh, binding. It is not uh, necessary uh, to ratify by a state, or even if a state ratifies and after decides not to, uh, not to follow, uh, they can do it without uh, zero or uh, close to zero uh, consequences. So this is why I uh, said that uh, I trust in uh, uh, national uh, legislation and in, um, in um, uh, national um, uh, constitutions and constitutional courts because uh, the right to um, a sustainable and healthy environment and uh, sustainable and healthy uh, social background is a universal human right that uh, all, um, all um, courts constitutional courts has to fight for in every uh, single state, I wow. guess. And okay. I hope Thank you. Yeah, so just a follow-up question from some of the questions in the Q&A. So if it's not binding, then how exactly can the countries be held accountable to, you know, to, you know, to polluting the environment in this case? Uh, going back to the uh, professor uh, uh, about the... Uh, um, about the pedagogy uh, that we heard and I enjoyed very much. So I have to admit that my field law is uh, not omnipotent. It is only an applied science. So we have goals and we strive, but sometimes we fail. But mm -hmm. pedagogy and the uh, future generations and young people, uh, this is our uh, treasury. This is our hope for the future. So as a, a professor, uh, I always uh, try to um, try to fix in the mind of my students that they should be aware uh, when whatever they do, legislators, mm -hmm. whatever they uh, they act, uh, it has uh, consequences for uh, for the future, as everything is connected with everything, and we have to be sensitive towards the rights of the future generations. So be cautious, be aware, and be sensitive, whatever they do in what, which, whatever field. Wow. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. yeah absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you very much, um, Professor Fallows, for, for the presentation. Really thank appreciate you. that. So um, well, there are other questions in the in the QA. So if you still have time, you're still going to be around, you can always check the QA and answer some of these questions there. I'm very sure the participants are eager to 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 hear your thoughts on some of these um questions in the QA. Thank you very much. So